Hi, everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. Always a pleasure coming your way as we continue with our discussion for the uh, August 2022 examination. And today we are starting with uh, one of the key issues that you guys requested for, and that is going to be the IFRS uh, masterclass, where we're going to be looking at the various things that we need to understand when it comes to dealing with the IFRSs, the IASs, and all of those things there. And this is going to be relevant to those of you writing financial reporting, because financial Financial reporting, the standards is going to be present there for 40 marks. In other words, we're going to be having a 20 mark dedicated question on the uh, standards. And then we're going to have the single entity financial statement, which can be either the statement of profit or loss and OCI, statement of changes in equity and statement of financial position, or we're going to have the cash flow statement uh, coming in there. And every footnote there, in the preparation of these financial statements are going to be based on the accounting standards, the IFRSs, the IASs. So in the financial reporting class, the accounting standards is going to be covering 40%. That is going to be crucial for you to be able to pass the examination. For uh, corporate reporting, we're going to be having the standards covering about 8 um 30% of the syllabus. In other words, we're going to be having about 20, 25 mark question coming in relating to the standards that we need to pay attention to and really know about in that particular case. So these are the things that we want to uh, really share our thoughts on and look at how we can deal with them in that regard. And I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. And also let me know in a comment session, any questions you have for me. Uh, let me know. I want to hear from you. Put it. So let me know in a comment session, any questions you have for me. Sorry for the feedback. Uh, put it in the chat for me, any questions you have, and let's get uh, the discussion going real quick in that particular case. Um, seeing some chats coming up. Uh, Nuruddin said, hi, hello, Nuruddin. Autry um, Bonsu said, good evening, boss. Good evening, Autry. Nuruddin said, hello, Shira. It seems the lecture stream did not hold what yesterday we didn't say we will have a lecture yesterday you can follow us on instagram because our meeting details will be posted on instagram uh so if anything we'll post on instagram isaac apo said hi hello isaac uh good evening i hope that you're doing well thanks for joining us on the live stream uh today any questions you put it in the chat for me i'll be glad to uh answer your questions for you and provide you with some assistance uh, that you need. Uh, Eric Autry on Facebook said, hi, sir. Hello, Eric. Thanks for joining us on the live stream today. Now, so we are looking at, at the IFRSs, and uh, this is, like I said earlier, a very basic and cru crucial aspect that we need to understand if we want to pass our financial reporting exams and corporate reporting exams. So we're going to be get, jumping straight up into the discussion. Let me just uh, bring up my screen here on the IFRSs quickly, then we go ahead. Now, note that my discussion will primarily be coming in from my book on financial uh, reporting and corporate reporting. So this is our book on financial reporting. Uh, you can get a copy of it. So everything I'm gonna be discussing in this uh, series in the IFRS masterclass is gonna be coming from my book. This is financial reporting. We also have for corporate reporting, which is the uh, volume one and volume two for corporate reporting. For the corporate reporting, the volume one covers the standards and covers uh, ratios and everything. Then the volume two covers the other issues that we need to uh, understand there. So my discussion is going to be coming in directly from uh, these books, uh, the financial reporting and then the corporate reporting book. And so that is the slide that is going. I'm going to be sharing primarily as we hold uh, these discussions here. Um, Amanza said, greetings, uh, looking forward to today's lecture. Okay, thanks for joining us, Amanza. And Nestin Kroma said, hello, Shira, I'm happy you are back. Thank you for joining us, um, Ernest. Excited to have you guys on the stream today. Okay, so let me uh, bring up my screen and uh, let's just get excited about the day's discussion.
let's go yep that's better so the accounting standards okay the accounting standards ifrs is and then the IASs. Now, like I mentioned, and uh, we've said already also in the uh, on our lectures on Monday, we may mention of the fact that when it comes to dealing with uh, or passing the corporate reporting exams or the financial reporting exams, the IFRSs are going to be very crucial in that case, and we need to understand the uh, those things there. So the first thing I want to do uh, uh, in a moment is to share my thoughts with you on these. Uh, let's see, my pencil is not picking me up. Let's see if I can get that fixed. Let's see. Okay, we're good. Let's bring her back. There you go. So the first thing is to discuss quickly, I mean, the issues in relation to the standards. So there are a couple of standards that I refer to as the key uh, standards or fundamental standards that you must know about as you prepare to go into the exam hall. Uh, they include the following, IAS 16, property, plant and equipment, IAS 12, income tax, IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers, revenue from contract with customers. Then you need to understand IFRS 9, financial instruments. It's a basic standard. You must make sure you understand this very well. Uh, as you go into the exam hall. Number five. Now, let me say this even before I proceed. Uh, when you are doing IAS 16, it doesn't work alone. So there are a number of standards that goes along with IAS 16. They include IAS 23, borrowing costs. IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, contingent assets. IAS 40, investment property. IAS 20, government grants, and then IFRS 5, non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation. Non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation. So these are uh, going to be standards that you have to learn and know about in addition to IAS 16. I get in it in addition to IAS 16. So IAS 16, IAS 12, IFRS 15, IFRS 9, financial instrument. You need to know these standards pretty well. You need to know them pretty well. Now, for level three people, that is corporate reporting students. For corporate reporting students, for corporate reporting students, there are certain standards that are going to be primary for you as you go into the exam hall, and they include the following. The first one is going to be IFRS nine financial instruments like i mentioned earlier so this is for level three corporate reporting students two ias 19 employee benefit employee benefits three ifrs2 share based payment share based payment you must know these standards very well. So IFRS 9, IAS 19, IFRS 2. What is going to be happening is that either at least two of these guys will be there or all the three will be in the exam hall. Okay? So for corporate reporting students, this is a definite or these are definite standards that you must make sure you know everything that relates to this standard. Now, let me say this carefully, that when you're dealing with IFRS 2, share-based payment, there is a deferred tax component there. So you must know about the deferred tax issue relating to the share-based payment. Okay? Now, what's going to happen is that either we will have a dedicated question on these standards, or the examiner will bring them as footnotes in the consolidated financial statements. 
Okay, either you have them as a dedicated question or you have a dedicated question on them for seven marks, six marks, or five marks, or the examiner will include them in the notes when it comes to dealing with a consolidated financial statement. Okay, when it comes to determining or dealing with a consolidated financial statement. So that is very, very important for you to understand. So for corporate reporting students, in addition to the fundamental issues that I'm listing here, I mean, you are really going to be uh, somebody who must understand the treatment of these uh, things here for you to pass the exams. Because at least two of them will be there in the exam hall. All the examiner is excited, all the three will be there. Like I said, either in the footnotes to the consolidated financial statement or as a dedicated question on its own that you must know about uh, in that case. So that is the issue about that. Now let's head back. So IAS 16, IAS 12, IFRS 15, IFRS 9. These are like standards that you must make sure like you are familiar with or you familiarize yourself with and understand the principle and there is a way you learn the standards and that is i'm going to show you that in a moment so you know how to deal with that then there are other standards like the ifrs 16 leases okay lease then we have the issue about ias 33 earnings per share we have ias 38 intangible assets we have ias 36 impairment of assets okay these are also standards that we must know about uh as we get ourselves into the exam hall then there are some basic standards like ias 2 inventories <laughs> Um, IAS 8, Accounting Policies, Changes in Accounting Estimates and Errors. IAS 10, Events After the Reporting Period. Events After the Reporting Period. All these standards are <laughs> something you must know about. Now, like I said earlier, you, you, you don't say, oh, the standards is too many. It's too, uh, it's plenty. It's a lot. How can I memorize all these? No. The standards are interconnected. Like I, I keep on telling you, when you are doing IAS 16, there is a relationship between IAS 16 and IAS 37. There is a tax about IAS 16. There is an impairment aspect about IAS 16. So you, you learn the standards as continuous and not as standalone topics. Not as standalone topics. Okay, so these are standards or the standards that uh, you need to learn. And yes, some of the standards are on their own. They don't have connection with others. Like, for instance, IAS 33, it's more on its own, doesn't have relationship with other standards uh, in that regard. Then uh, something like uh, IAS, IFRS 9 financial instrument, it's more on its own. It, uh, it, look, it doesn't look like it has a connection with other standards in that particular case. But then Aside these standards, the other ones have some relationship, have some uh, connections that you need to be aware of, that you need to be aware of. Then for our corporate reporting students, in addition to these three standards that are basic, there is also going to be IFRS 8, uh, segment reporting or operating segments. Operating segments, that's also uh, exclusive level three standard that you need to uh, know about in that regard. So. These issues are going to be there for you. Then for consolidated financial statements, there are standards about consolidated financial statements. And we may uh, have theories on that or we may not have theories about standards. So you must know the standards that are related to uh, consolidated financial uh, statements. And that is going to be the issue about um, IFRS 10, IFRS three ias 27 uh, ias 28 okay these are consolidated uh related standards that you would have to uh also know about and you know when you get to consolidation you're going to be dealing with that uh later on so in the accounting standards perspective or category 
these are the things that we need to understand. Like I said, don't see them as a list of standards that you need to know because the standards are interconnected. And if you learn them in the manner that they are connected, then you put yourself in the spot to be able to pass the examination. And as we continue with it, with this masterclass, we'll be trying as much as possible to go through as many of the standards as we can in that regard. And like I said, all of the uh, content that we'll be sharing exclusively on this masterclass will be coming in from my financial reporting uh, book or and my corporate reporting book as well. I'm seeing some comments coming in. Let's see if I can pick them up. Francisca said, good evening, Nishira. Good evening, Francisca Boache. Then she said what? Please, I want one of the copy reporting books. Uh, how do I get it? Uh, you can send a message on WhatsApp 050-114-9296 and uh, make a payment. Delivery can be arranged for you nationwide. 114-9296, 050-114-9296. You send hi on WhatsApp. And you'll be able to make payment and uh, delivery can be done for you. Uh, it's 135 Ghana cities. That is for the volume one and volume two together. It's 135. The corporate reporting is uh, 120. The financial reporting, sorry, is 120 Ghana cities. Corporate reporting volume one and two is uh, together 135. So you can call, uh, sorry, you can WhatsApp and uh, you'll be able to get the delivery done for you. Stan Obi uh, said, good, good day, uh, good insurer, trust you are well. Yes, I'm good. Uh, been a while. What of IS41? Yeah, that's biological assets. That standard will be lent alongside IS2 inventories. I put that here. That is treated usually with inventory IS41, uh, agriculture, biological assets and agriculture. Uh, so that is uh, going to be lent together with um how do we call it? Inventories. Okay, that will be lent together with inventories. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. This is our IFRS masterclass. If there are any questions you have for me, please put it in the chat. I'll be really excited to answer uh, for you. But also, let me know in the chat any questions that you have for me. I would want to uh, hear from you and answer your questions as well. Okay, so now that we've seen the overview of the standards, um, how do we lend them <laughs> in that particular case? That, that's the big question. Because some of the questions I've been receiving is, Shira, hmm, this accounting standard I've learned, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned, huh? but how can I lend them? Like I said, Know that the standards are interrelated. The standards are interrelated. Okay, that is the first thing I want you to know. When I say the standards are interrelated, this is what I mean. When you are learning IAS 12, income tax, don't just learn income tax and say, oh, I understand the fair tax. I understand that, oh, when the carrying amount of the asset uh, is greater than the tax base of the asset, it results into deferred tax liability because it is taxable temporary difference. If the current amount is less than the tax base of the asset, it results to deferred tax asset. And, and that is because it is deductible temporary difference. No, that, that's, that's too lame. Okay, that's, that's not just where you're going to be. All right? But then if you are learning IAS 12, you need to find out what are the connection between IAS 12 and IAS 16? Because there is. When assets are revalued, it results into uh, income tax. There may be uh, deferred tax issues coming in because of revaluation of assets. So when you're learning IAS 12, it's important you bear that in mind. Again, IAS 12 income tax has some relationship with IFRS 2, share-based payments. Because if there is a share option, we need to find out about the tax implication of that at the end of the day. So that is also another crucial part that you need to know about. So it is not just about, oh, I have learned IAS 12. Now I understand IAS 12. Okay, 
How about if you are doing IIS 12 combined with IIS 16? How about if you are doing IFRS 2 combined with IIS 12? How are you going to do it? So note that the standards are what? Interrelated. Again, you are learning IIS 16. You need to understand that as you are learning IIS 16, there are some connection. There is IIS 36 implication there, impairment, because we can test for impairment for tangible non-current assets. How do we deal with that? You must know that. When you're learning IIS 16, you must know that there will be pro there may be provisions. So uh, when there is provision coming in on the assets, how do we deal with that? And that is IIS 37. There is a connection in between that. We must know about it. Then also, if you're learning IIS 16, like I just mentioned, there is a tax issue about that. You must know about it. When you're learning IIS 16, you must understand that there could be borrowing cost. And so you must know how do we ca uh, capitalize the borrowing cost in that particular case. So that is the issue that you must understand when we talk about uh, this thing. So know that point number one, the standards are interrelated. The standards are interrelated. Don't learn them in isolation. Don't say, oh, I have finished learning IAS 16. You are lying. Because if I put together an, a question that you need to apply IAS 16, you need to apply IAS 37, and you need to apply IAS 23 in one question, you'll find out that you'll be, you'll be, you will not be able to solve it. It means you don't understand the standards. So you don't learn and dumb the principles. You don't learn and throw the principles away. You learn IAS 16, you keep the principles because you know it is going to come in when you are looking at IAS 23. It is going to come in when you are looking at IAS 12. It is going to come in when you are looking at IAS 37. So that is the first thing I want you to understand, that the standards are interrelated. Number two on how to understand the accounting standards to increase the chances of passing the examination. So understanding that the standards are interrelated, it's more or less like a mindset issue, okay? It's, it's a mindset issue. That is something you must know. Number two is that you need a great tuition on these things. That's the second thing. You need a great tuition on these things because you need to understand how the standards are weaved together the relationship that exists among the standards or between the standards in order for you to increase your chances of passing the examination. So you need a great tuition. That is why I always recommend to people, attend lectures, okay? Attend lectures. It's not enough for you to say, oh, I, I watch your videos on YouTube. Attend lectures. At get somewhere and attend lectures. I'm not saying uh, take lecture or study under my mentorship because probably you will not be comfortable studying directly under my mentorship. For instance, you don't do assignment. I suck you from the class and, uh, you know, you can have a lot of uh, uh, discouragement in that spirit because there is an environment I create for my students at the end of the day. But you need to attend lectures. You need a great tuition to understand these standards. Why do you need a great tuition to understand these standards? So that you can get the principles. Okay, so that you can get the principles. So that in a nutshell, in a nutshell, when we talk about IAS 12, what are we talking about? In a nutshell, when we talk about IAS 16, what the heck is that? In a nutshell, when we talk about IAS 37, what are we driving home at? C can we make a one-liner statement or three-liner statement relating to IAS uh, 37? Can you, can you just make a, a three-pointer statement to summarize everything on IAS 37? That is the second thing you must understand. Understanding the principles. And you need a great tuition to be able to understand the principles. So once you understand the principles, this is where you come in because you are responsible for this. you got to practice a lot of questions. You practice questions. So how do I learn the standards? In short, how do I let the standards stay in my head? Number one, understand that the standards are interrelated. Number two, get a great tuition. But number three, you practice a lot of questions. This is after you've learned the principles. Now, please, the way you practice question is not about reading the answer. Because some of you, you pick the question, then you look at the solution. Then you are reading the question. You, look, you are looking at the solution. No. When we say practice question, it means you solve the question under time. And the reason why you need to practice the questions under time is that that is going to be leading to the exam hall later. 
So this is going to take you later on to the exam hall. So if the question you see the marks there as 10 marks, that means you need 18 minutes around that question. If the question is seven marks, then you need to know that uh, 1.8 by seven, you know that you need about 12 minutes, you know, some 12 and a half minute, a little to 30 minutes to solve that question. And you have to time yourself. You have to time yourself. Now, it means that you need to create personal time to study. So again, for those of you who are lazy and you attend lectures and, you know, that's all, you open the books once a week, you're not going to understand the standards. You're going to screw it up because you need to have time on your own to study. You need to have time on your own, dedicated after you attend lectures, after you watch a video, to practice questions on your own. But if you sit there and you're like, oh, I am busy. Oh, my boss. Oh, my wife. Oh, my children. Like I tell you always, ICA doesn't give a shit about you. We don't care whether you are married. ICA doesn't care whether you have 16 children or whether your boss is uh, whoever. The only criteria is once you register for the exams, you go write the exams. If you fail, that's it. It's on you. If you pass, it's on you. So you got to make time to practice a lot of questions. So, Inshira, how do I understand the standards? This is how you understand the standards. There's no miracle. Okay, there's no deliverance anywhere. That's the only way you understand the standards. Have the mindset that the standards are interrelated. Get a great tuition, attend lectures to understand the principles very well. And most importantly, practice a lot of questions. This is how you get your principles. This is how you will be able to understand the standards pretty well so that you can position yourself to pass the examination. Because like I say, if the standards are going to be 40 marks, for those of you doing FR, what are you waiting for, man? What are you waiting for? you got to start learning it. 40 marks, that's serious. That's serious. If you, if you are studious, you are careful enough, you're able to get 30 of that, you're good. And plus the other ones, you will be able to pass, definitely. But you screw it up there, you may not do well. You may not do well. So it, it, how do I learn the standards? That's how you learn the standards. That's how you learn the standards. Any questions for me, please? Any questions? I see a chat coming in. Amwa. Amwa. Uh, what? Obeying Michael said, please, I want to register for tuition, but I tried and I couldn't succeed on your platform. Please help. You can send a message on WhatsApp, 050-114-9296. That's, you can send a message on WhatsApp, and my executive assistant will provide you with whatever assistance you need in order for you to complete your enrollment. So Michael, you can send her on WhatsApp on that number, 0501149296, and you will be assisted on that. Okay, so that's the thing we need to understand generally when it comes to dealing with uh, the standards. So this is just to, you know, set the tone for you pretty well. as we get excited about uh, the discussion. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me know if there are any questions. Uh, you put it in the chat for me, or uh, you put it in the comment section for me. In that case, I'm seeing another chat coming up. Uh, Victoria Kesewa said, I am in Cape Coast. How do I join your class? Any online option? Yes, our lectures are online via Zoom. Our lectures are online. Uh, via Zoom with our study portal uh, accessible and also our mobile application are accessible. So our, our live lectures are via Zoom. Videos are recorded and are available on our portal, insurapremium.com or, or in our mobile application, which you can download as well on the Google Play Store or the App Store. So yes, you can join our lectures to study under my mentorship online uh, and that's possible. And that's 390 Ghana cities per paper. 390 Ghana cities per paper. So, Kesewa, um, you can study with us if you want to because it's possible. All right? Okay. 
So now that we've got those uh, overview key areas to focus on and all those things out of the place, you know, let's get excited about the discussion and let's start with non-current assets. Non-current assets. Now, yeah, from the conceptual framework, assets are resources controlled by an entity as a result of past events, okay? As a result of past events. That's all. That's the definition of an asset. Resources controlled by an entity. The keyword here is control. So it's not about something we own, okay? <clears throat> but something we control, okay? Then it is our asset. Now, when we say an entity controls an asset, it means the entity would direct the usage of the asset. Then it means that significantly economic benefits, future economic benefits or service potential in the asset flows to the entity. So that is the idea about assets, resources controlled by an entity as a result of past events. Now, that is a KG2 uh, definition that you have to be aware of, okay? That's a KG2 definition you have to be aware of. So Victoria, Kesewa, Som, Israel, Abubakar, Adamo, thank you for the thumbs up on Facebook. So when it comes to assets, they can be categorized into uh, certain classes. Uh, we can have what we call um, current assets, you know, and then we can have non-current assets. Okay, current assets and then non-current assets. The non-current assets can further be divided into two. We have the tangible non-current assets. And then we have the intangible, okay, assets. The tangible non-current assets and then the intangible asset. Our excitement uh, here, when we are dealing with standards generally, will be centering around the non-current asset. And so that is what we want to start our journey with. So when it comes to the non-current assets, what are the standards that we are going to be paying attention to or looking out for? So the following will be the standards that we'll be covering under the non-current assets. Certainly, we need to look at the grandpapa of standards, and that is IAS 16, property plans and equipment. Property plans and equipment. Then we need to look at IAS 20, government grant. Then we look at IAS 23, that's borrowing cost. Then we look at IAS 40, investment property. Then you need to know about IFRS 5, and that is non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation. Non-current asset held for sale. and discontinued operation. So when it comes to the non-current assets, these are like the core standards that we need to understand. IAS 16, property plants and equipment, IAS 20, government grants, IAS 23, borrowing costs, IAS 40, investment property, IFRS 5, non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation we need to understand these standards pretty well okay we need to understand these standards pretty well but when you are learning the ias 16 guy you no, know, this guy when you're learning ias 16 there are certain things that you need to understand so the ias 16 part comes along with a, a number of standards as well like ias 37 provisions contingent liability contingent assets IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, contingent assets. So there's a connection there. Then IAS 36, impairment of assets. Impairment of assets. Now, usually you have to know about IAS 37 because of initial recognition of the assets. So when I'm dealing with initial recognition of 
an asset, IAS 37 may come in and you would have to use the knowledge from there. Then when you're dealing with subsequent measurement, that is where IAS 36 may come in in payment of asset. Okay, subsequent measurement. So you see what I'm doing now? I'm showing you how the standards are interrelated and how you lend them. So as part of the initial recognition of the asset, IAS 37 must be known. As part of the subsequent measurement of the assets, impairment of assets must be known, IAS 36. Then still under, as part of initial recognition, government grants is also something we must know about. And then borrowing costs may be something that we have to also know about. So that is the idea. So even though primarily these are the non-current asset standards, we come along with IAS 37. Uh, 7 and IAS 36. Then also, the last one there will be, you know, IAS 12, income tax. Again, that works when we are dealing with subsequent measurement. So when I'm dealing with subsequent measurement of the assets, then IAS 12 may come to town that you must also know about. So uh, I'm showing you this so that at every stage of the standard you are learning, you know how or what to pay attention to and what to take away generally. I hope you are getting the treatment. That is how we, we, we're going to be looking at this. So let's begin the journey with IAS 16 definitely. And then I'm going to be injecting the other standards into the discussion as we go ahead. So please stay with me carefully. It's going to be an interesting journey. So IAS 16, property, plants, and equipment property plants and equipment eh, equipment i'm writing events here so ias 16 property plants and equipment property plants and equipment so what is property plants and equipment now before I even get excited about that as well, when you take any standard at all, most of the standards, a number of things you must know about will be what is the objective of the standard? Like what is this standard trying to do? So objective or objectives of the standards. Number two, you need to ask yourself, what are the key definitions about this standard that I need to know about? Because some key terminologies about the standards and, and the examiner can ask you theoretically those key definitions in the standards. So you must ask yourself, what are the key definitions in the standards that you need to know about? Number three will be the <coughs> recognition criteria, because a couple of the standards have recognition criteria that we need to be uh, aware of as we study. For instance, if you are dealing with IAS 16, there is a recognition criteria. When you are dealing with IAS 37, there is a recognition criteria you have to be aware of when you are dealing with uh, IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers. There is a recognition criteria that we must uh, know about. So what are the recognition criteria? Then we need to deal with initial uh, measurements, which is going to be the same as initial recognition. How do we first the first time that that transaction is brought into the books, how do we recognize it? How do we measure it? And then we have to do subsequent measurements. Subsequent measurements. And then certainly any disclosure requirements. Any disclosure requirements. Note that your exam question can come from each of these, okay? Yeah, certainly the objective is a low key, but then the key definition, the recognition criteria, the initial measurement, the subsequent measurement, the disclosure requirements, all these are areas that examiner control questions from. So either it's gonna be a written or a comment question that you have to be aware of, or it's gonna be computational question that you need to deal with. So for most of the standards or almost all the standards, when you pick it up, these things must be known. What is the objective? What are the key definitions? What are the recognition criteria? What is the initial measurement or initial recognition? What is the subsequent measurement? What are the disclosure requirements that we need to know about? So for each of the standards, you must have a summary of these. So I don't know, maybe you can create 
a, a notepad or a summary document or whatever it is. But each of the standards you must have at your fingertips the principles relating to criteria for recognition, uh, initial measurements, subsequent measurements, and all of those things. Are you getting it? And all of those things. I see some of you guys coming up. Uh, give us a thumbs up on the video when you join and also comment in the chat box if you have any questions for me, something you would want me to uh, share my thoughts on. And also remember you can share the video so we can reach many students and get many students watching the video. So let's go, IAS 16. Hey, 16. Now, this is a starting point of the standards. Now, certainly uh, there are some introductory standards, but I'm, I'm not going to be dealing with them uh, here on in the masterclass, IAS2 inventories. Uh, when we are solving questions later on, I could bring this up. Uh, IAS8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates. I will not teach it really, but uh, it is something that you can uh, be expecting later on. Then IAS10, events after the reporting period this is also another fundamental standard so these are like fundamental uh standards that we you need to you know understand about and know their treatments there in a summary way when it comes to ias2 the, the idea about ias2 generally is that um inventory should be uh measured at lower of cost or net realizable value so that is the key takeaway uh when it comes to ias2 that inventory is measured at lower of cost uh, and net realizable value. In other words, if we want to determine the closings, the current amount of inventory, the amount at which inventory should be carried in our books, we're going to be comparing the cost of the inventory to the net realizable value. Now, the net realizable value is simply the fair value less cost to sell. Okay, the fair value less cost to sell. That is the net realizable value. The cost of the inventory is the cost of the inventory, the full factory cost, okay? The full factory cost uh, of the inventory uh, in that regard. So we compare the cost of the inventory, the cost at which we bought it, or the full factory cost if we manufacture manufactured the inventory. So the purchases cost or the uh, full cost full factory cost for manufacturing to the net realizable value the lower of the two is the amount at which the inventory is going to be carried now if it happens that the cost is greater than the net realizable value it means the inventory has suffered impairment so it means that there is an impairment in the inventory generally it means there is an impairment in the inventory and if there is an impairment in the inventory, then what does that mean? If there is an impairment in the inventory, it means that it's written off in the PL account. Okay, so it is recognized as expenses in the profit or loss. In profit or loss. Are you getting the, the summary takeaway? Are you getting the summary takeaway? Then the, the journal entry on that is that you debit profit or loss. Okay, then you credit inventory. In other words, the inventory has lost value. The inventory has reduced in value because you are carrying the inventory in your books. You, you spent 10,000 to buy the inventory, but now if you sell that inventory, you can get only 8,000 on it. If that is the case, then what do you do? You carry it at the 8,000 so that the 2,000 is what we recognize in the what? p &L account. Are you getting the treatment? So that is the takeaway there. Now, the opposite is true. What is the opposite? If it happens that the cost of the inventory is less than the net realizable value, you don't say, oh, let me carry at the net realizable value. Nope, 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 nope. So if the cost of the inventory is less than the realizable amounts or the net realizable value the inventory is carried at a cost definitely you don't treat it as revaluation of assets okay so the inventory is uh carried at its cost the inventory is carried at its cost that's it that's it so it, when you talk about inventory primarily you know 
This is the main takeaway. Yeah, there is uh, keeping keeping of inventory, FIFO, LIFO, and those guys. Yeah, that's 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 also there. But the, the main takeaway for you, in order for you to be able to prepare the financial statement, is to understand this primary principle. Is to understand this primary principle. That's that's the takeaway generally. That's the takeaway generally. And if you come to IAS 8 also, it's it's more or less like the same thing. With IAS 8, accounting policy, changes in accounting estimates and errors, there are three things that you need to understand there. Accounting estimates. Okay. I mentioned I'm not going to teach you this, but I just want to see if I can give you some summary. Accounting estimates. Then we have accounting policies. Then we have prior period error. So these are the three things that you need to understand here. Now, accounting policy is the starting point. These are the rules, the principles used to prepare the financial statement. Now, if there is a change in accounting policy, it is applied retrospectively. Okay, retrospective application. There is a retrospective application here. Now, when we say retrospective application, what the heck is that? It means that uh, that change will affect the current year financial statement and for comparative purposes, previous year financial statement as well. In other words, you apply the standard as though it's been there all this while. So, for instance, if an entity uh, uh, was treating an expenses as part of cost of sales or they were let, let's put it this way maybe they were you know classifying or treat writing off a cost as an expenses then all of a sudden they are now capitalizing that same cost that is a change in accounting policy and so it must be applied retrospectively okay it must be applied retrospectively and so that is very crucial. Or the methods of valuing inventories. Maybe they were using FIFO to value inventories. Then they change it up to use the weighted average method. Okay, that is a change in accounting policy. It must be applied retrospectively. It must be applied retrospectively. But then you must understand that there are conditions that must be satisfied before an entity can change its accounting policy. Number one, if there is a new standard about the treatment of that transaction or there is a new interpretation by the International Accounting Standard Board, then, you know, we have to change our accounting policy. So you don't just get up and say, oh, this year we've done this. So next year we'll do this. No, it's, you don't go with your feelings. There are guidelines. So number one, if there is a new standard, then you go by that. Or there's a new interpretation by the International Accounting Standard Board and its uh, interpretation committee, then you need to change the standard. Another reason why an entity may change a standard is if it will enhance, you know, uh, faithful representation of the financial statements. Okay, it will enhance faithful representation. and relevance of the financial statement. Remember, these are fundamental qualitative characteristics of financial statements. These are qualitative, fundamental qualitative characteristics of the financial statement. So we will change the accounting policy if it will enhance faithful representation and relevance of the financial statement. These are fundamental characteristics of the financial statement. So if it will enhance it, why not? Like, for instance, we were... Treating an expenses or we were treating a transaction as an expenses. But if we look at it, it shouldn't be an expenses. It should rather be capitalized. Right. That will enhance faithful representation of the financial statement. So what do we do? We do it. We adopt it in that particular case. So that is the idea there about that particular one. So if there's a new standard, we change it. If uh, it will enhance faithful representation of financial statements, then we change it. Then some exceptionally, there is a third uh, way or reason why, especially if the company is new, if the entity is new, then it is now trying to adopt their standards. So uh, it may not do it the same way. So maybe this year they will use FIFO. Uh, next year they will use another standard 
also there will be a change because it's a new entity they are now trying to see how those items could be treated or maybe they don't have uh the people or the rights guidelines on but usually it is the first two that will be the guiding principle so when there's a change in accounting policy we do retrospective application we apply it as though it has been there all this while does that make sense let me know in the chat box any questions put it in the chat for me Give us a thumbs up on the video if you're getting some value already. And let's get more people coming on. Then accounting estimates has to do with usually judgments. Okay, accounting estimate has to do with judgments. So if there is change in accounting estimates, we apply it prospectively. So that is prospective application. That is prospective application. Prospective application means it affects only current uh, financial state, current year financial statements and uh, future financial statements. So we don't go back. Okay, we don't go back. We it affects just current financial statements and then future uh, years financial statements in that particular case. So, for instance, we are changing um, the uh, economic useful life of the asset. That's a change in accounting estimates. That is not anything. Uh, changes in the provision for bad debts that we make. That is changes in accounting estimates. That is not an issue. You just uh, apply it to the current year and then the previous year. Uh, in the, sorry, the current year and then the subsequent year in that particular case. And all of these things are well explained with example in our book on uh, financial reporting or corporate reporting generally. Then the last one is going to be prior period adjustment. Prior period adjustment is where an entity identify an error committed in the previous year financial statement in the current year. Okay, so what happens is that, like the name suggests, prior period error. Prior period error. Meaning that we are recognizing the error currently, but the error relates to last year. So when there is prior period adjustment, there is what we call Re, uh, retrospective application. So we do a retrospective application because it relates to last year. So you go to the last year and amend last year's financial statement. Retrospective application. Usually, it is something that is going to be done in the retained earnings. If you are preparing your financial statement and you see that, it is something that will be done in the retained earnings, uh, which will be part of the statement of changes in equity when you are preparing that. So usually prior period errors are going to be uh, seen or treated in the retained earnings and that will be part of the, uh, that will be in the statement of changes in equity. So if we talk about IAS aids, this is the basic takeaway, okay? This is the basic takeaway of IAS aids. So you must know what is an example of accounting policy, changes in accounting policy. What is an example of changes in accounting estimates? If you know that it's, a, it's an accounting policy, then when they change it, you have to do retrospective application. If you know that it is an accounting estimate, when they change it, you have to do only prospective application. For prior period error, we have to generally do prospective application. Now, the final takeaway is how far is too far? <laughs> so, for instance, we say when there is a change in accounting estimate, apply it to the current year and the previous year. So, the question you ask yourself is how many years can you go back? Now, it depends on the practicality of the uh, change. So, sometimes the entity can go back just a year, one year. Sometimes it can go back two years. Or sometimes it may not even go back at all because the entity may see that it is impractical to do retrospective application. And that is allowed in IAS 18, uh, in IAS 8, that if it is impractical to do retrospective application, then even though it is a change in accounting policy, it will be applied prospectively. So that is a note you must take care of. That yes, even though the notes, the rule says, oh, when there is change in accounting policy, do retrospective application, the uh, standard also gives guidelines that if it is impractical, to do retrospective application, then, you know, you just apply it prospectively. It affects current year and future financial statements. So that is the idea also about IAS 8. Okay. So the main takeaway on IAS 2 
you need to have that coming in. Then the main takeaway on IAS 8, you know, you got to have that coming in. That's the main takeaways. The main takeaways. Then the last, I'm seeing some charts coming in. Let's see if I can take them really quick. From Facebook, Ben Asa said, Hi, Shira. Can you give a brief overview of sales and lease back under IFRS 16? I don't know what you mean by brief overview, though, but uh, we would look at IFRS 16. is one of the standards we'll be looking at. So let's see if I can do that. If not, I will uh, look at that later on in our discussion. And there is a specific video on our channel on sale and lease back. You can watch it. It's around 16 minute video. You can look at a playlist, the accounting standard playlist on our YouTube channel, and you can watch the sale and lease back, the full video. I solved a question also about it. So you can watch that video and you'll be able to get your uh, the total things that you need to understand there. Then uh, Bernard Pinstel said, God bless you. I'm now getting to know how to learn uh, the standards. Okay, Bernard, that is awesome to uh, hear about that. So that's that's the standards. Then the last one is in the in the introductory things will be IAS 10 events after the reporting period. Now, what is the takeaway also of this? events after the reporting period events after the reporting period now note that you can get access to all these videos the full lecture for all of these videos on our study portal i get in it if you visit on, on our study portal insurapremium.com you will be able to i mean get access to the full content on these uh, lectures, if you go to financial reporting or corporate reporting, you'll be able to uh, get access to these. Now, certainly it means you have to enroll in the course because it's not available. We covered all of those <coughs> standards here in, in much detail with questions, practice questions, as you can see here uh, in that regard. So when it comes to IAS 10 events after the reporting period, what is the main takeaway? What is the main takeaway? Events after the reporting period is events after the reporting period. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, the, re the, the year end, the, diff the distance between the year ended, okay, and when financial statements are authorized for approval, sorry, financial statements are authorized for publication, It's what we refer to as the event, the, the, uh, the period after the reporting. So between the time the year ends, so let's say the company's year ended is 1st October, sorry, 30, 31st October. That's the year ended of the company. If they publish their financial statement in January, 3rd January, the following year, then the period from 1st November to 2nd of January, transactions will occur. Activities may go on. The question we ask ourselves is, those transactions that are taking place from the year end to the time we publish the financial statements, is it prudent for us to bring it to the knowledge of the users of the financial statements? The answer is yes. We have to bring those events to the understanding of the uh, users of the financial statements that we are just publishing. And so these events after the reporting period can further be divided into two. For the takeaway, we have the adjusting events. Okay? We have the adjusting events and then the non-adjusting events. Now, if the events is adjusting, it simply means that it requires some attention. For that reason, you would have to amend the financial statements. So there has to be amendments to the financial statement. So you cannot publish the financial statement in its raw case. If the event is adjusting, you have to amend the financial statement. You have to change some of the figures that has been in the financial statement. But now, when we say an adjusting event, what does that mean? 
It means it is an event that is occurring after the year end, which gives us evidence of a condition existing at the year end. Okay, so adjusting events are events occurring after the year end, which provides evidence or more information on condition existing as at the end of the year. So for instance, during the year, there was a court case. Okay, during the year, there was a court case. And as at the end of the year, ruling had not been given. So if ruling has not been given, as per IAS 37, we may have to uh, provide for a, a, a financial a contingent liability if we are supposed to make payment or recognize contingent asset if we are going to receive something from the ruling. So as at the end of the year, the ruling was not given or hadn't been given. So we were not sure what we would do. But then since our year ended is October, in November or maybe around 15th of November, ruling came. So that becomes what? An adjusting event. Because now that ruling has given us the fact on how much we have to recognize in our books or provide for in our books relating to the court case, which was existing at the reporting date. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So that is the idea about adjusting events. That is the idea about adjusting events. That's the idea about adjusting events. Then a customer who, you know, declares bankrupt or going into bankruptcy is also an adjusting event. Why is that? Because at the end of the year, we may do provision for bad debts. Okay, for the uh, for the pr prudence concept, it requires that we do provision for bad debts. You know, we have to make provision for future losses. So, as at the end of the year, probably we did a provision for only five percent. But now, on tenth December, when we thought we are preparing to chop Christmas, the customer filed for bankruptcy and says we can't get the money. So that means that now we may have to consider to write that debt off or increase our provision from the 5% to probably 15% or maybe to 20%. Again, that gives us evidence to something that was existing at the end of the year. Does that make sense? So that is adjusting events. That is adjusting events. Then non-adjusting events technically means non-adjusting. It means these events, when they occur, we only have to make disclosure in the financial statement. Okay, we make disclosure in the notes to the financial statement. So for non-adjusting events, we make disclosure in the notes to the financial statements. We make disclosure in the notes to the financial statement. Now, what are non-adjusting events? These are events that are not giving, that doesn't have any connection with something existing at a reporting date. So for instance, uh, the company acquires some assets after the reporting date. Okay, we don't care about that. Or the company disposes of an asset. We don't care about that. That is not an, uh, an adjusting event. It's a non-adjusting event generally in that particular case. So we wouldn't consider it. We wouldn't adjust the financial statement. We just have to disclose it in the notes. Or fire outbreak in, a, in one of our factory. I mean, that is not a big deal. We may not have to uh, adjust the financial statement. But this is the takeaway here. This is the last takeaway here. You have to be careful because non-adjusting events can become adjusting if it affects the going concern of the entity. Okay? So in non-adjusting events, in non-adjusting events, may be treated as adjusting as adjusting events if it affects the going concern of the entity. If it affects the going concern of the entity. So for instance, the entity has a factory. Then there is fire outbreak at the factory. So we lost, we lose our equipment and all that. Now that is a non-adjusting event. Okay, that's a non-adjusting event in its raw state. That's a non-adjusting event. But probably the company is a typical Ghanaian company. Now, you know a typical Ghanaian company? A, a typical Ghanaian company is a company that doesn't do insurance. So they don't do insurance. 
a typical Ghanaian company is a company where the owner of the business redraws the money and uses it to chop and buy cars to flex around. So there is no uh, surplus funding or surplus funds available. A typical Ghanaian company is a company that doesn't build the capacity to even raise debt finance in times of need. So the factory is gone. But the company had no insurance. The company doesn't have any surplus fund. Neither can the company borrow money because, I mean, their bankers don't even trust them. Now, in that case, even though the factory outbreak is seen as a non-adjusting event which requires disclosure in the notes to the financial statement, because there is no insurance, there is no surplus fund, and the entity cannot you know, have a factory, if there is no factory, then there is no business. Then in that case, it means it becomes adjusting. So probably we would have to change our way of preparing a financial statement from a going concern perspective to a break up perspective. So that is what we are saying here. If it happens that the non-adjusting event affects the going concern of the entity, then it will be treated as what? An adjusting event, which means we will go back and amend the financial statement. These are, you know, the takeaway, the summary when it comes to dealing with these introductory uh, standards in that case. Any questions, please? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions for me? So that is the issue about these fundamental uh, standards that we need to understand and the summary takeaway and the summary takeaway. Okay. Now that we've, uh, you know, gotten those guys out of the way, then we need to go into the real deal, which is our main discussion. And that is property plants and equipment. That is property plants and equipment. But because of time constraints, I'm going to be concluding around uh, here today uh, for the discussion. I mean, we have a management accounting class uh, coming up uh, in just a few minutes uh, for today for our main class. So I'm going to be concluding around uh, here today, and we're going to be continuing uh, with this uh, in our next meeting. Remember, you can follow me on Instagram because... Uh, when, when we will be posting details of our lectures and everything on my Instagram page, it's still in Shira Premium as the name here, and uh, you'll be able to get updates on everything that we are doing. Like I said, uh, everything that I'm going to be sharing with you in this uh, session is going to be coming from my financial reporting book. I mean, this is a new book that we released just this year, a little over a month old, uh, financial reporting or the corporate reporting volume one and two as well, where we explain all of these standards with practice questions, with practice questions to enable you to understand the standards and also be able to pass the examination. I'm seeing a chat coming in. Let's see what, what I have there. Sylvester said, uh, the non-adjusting between the year, I don't understand your statements. The non-adjusting between the year and reporting dates. I don't understand what you're saying. Maybe give me some context there, and uh, I can provide you with some uh, thing on that. So that is it. Um, if there are any details, uh, something that you want to know about or get copies of our books, uh, you can WhatsApp us 0501149296 and. Uh, once you make payments, delivery will be arranged for you and you can get access to the book at the end of the day so that you'll be uh, able to study with it in that regard. In case you want to also enroll in our full course as well, you can uh, check the description of this video. The very first link uh, will lead you to our website, insurapremium.com, uh, and you can uh, enroll in a course at 390 Ghana Cities and uh, join our live Zoom sessions and also study directly under my mentorship so that you can prepare well for the exams. Okay, Sylvester has come with 
something. Let me see. Said what? The non-adjusting and adjusting are events happening between year end and the reporting date. What do you mean by year? Year end and reporting date are the same. There is no difference between year end and reporting date. The adjusting or non-adjusting events, they are happening between the year end. When the organization's financial year ends, for instance, I say here 31st October, that is the year ended or that is the reporting date of the entity. Okay, so the di difference, the time between the year end of the company or the reporting date of the company and the day that the financial statements are authorized to be published or to be made available to the shareholders, it's what we refer to as the events after the reporting period. The things occurring between these two distances is what refers to as the events after the reporting period. So year end is the same as reporting date for information. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so that's it about that. I'm going to conclude uh, around here today. And uh, Felix Giza and Constant Chalwi, thank you very much for the thumbs up on the video on uh, Facebook. Uh, Amwa Obey Michael, Victoria Kesewa, Som Isra, Abubaka Adamu. Also, thank you very much for the thumbs up on the video on uh you, uh, fa Facebook still. Uh, YouTube, guys, thank you very much for the thumbs up. Really appreciate it. Uh, keep on, uh, stay connected. Follow me on Instagram and meeting details are going to be posted there and you'll be able to know our discussions uh, and when we'll be having sessions in that particular case. So that is it. I'm going to be ending here today. Thanks very much for joining uh, on the live stream. Like I said, the takeaway is know the standards are interrelated get a great tuition on the standards, uh, like get a great tuition, attend lectures uh, and be guided so that you, are, you can understand the principles. But number three, most importantly, is that you need to practice a lot of questions because without more practice, without uh, attention to the questions, you're going to screw up big time. You're going to screw up big time. So if you understand these three things, I can guarantee you, you know, standards will not be your issue. Financial reporting will not be your problem. And definitely, corporate reporting will not be an issue that you would have to handle in that particular case. So that's it about that. Thanks, guys. And I'll catch you some other time on our live stream as we continue with our discussion. Stay safe and stay blessed. Bye-bye.